Midwich Cuckoos by John Wyndham. Dramatized for radio in three parts by William Ingram. With Charles Kay as Bernard Westcott, William Gaunt as Richard Gayford, and Manning Wilson as Gordon Zelby. The Midwich Cuckoos, part one. Loud and clear, Echo One. Your present position. Over. Following the main Midwich Road. I see the military have got their roadblocks up. Done a good job. Three mile tail back. You can hear the horn honking from here. Roger, Wrecker. Trouble ahead. Coming up to it now. Quite a bit of it. One fire engine keeled over near side wheel in the ditch. Black saloon car ditto. Man off his bike, a couple of hundred yards further on. I'm coming up to a school bus now. I had a right shambles. Any movement? Negative base. Leaving the road route now, heading across the fields to Midwich Village itself. Understood. Midwich coming up fast now. Kyle Manor, the Grange. Just passing over the village square. In the same story base. Everything as normal down there, except no movement. Either keeled over, like the people back there on the road, or... I don't know, living statues is about as near as you could get to it. It's odd. Very odd. A report, please. Over. I've just spotted something. Near the old Abbey ruins. Coming up fast now. Definitely out of the ordinary. Pale oval... Now, it's hard to tell from this height. It'd be like an inverted spoon. Definitely out of the ordinary. But hold on. Uh, I'll, I'll just shoot some film for you boffins to scratch your heads over when I get back. Now, it's only a shadow to go by. It's pretty hopeless. Look, base, uh, I'm going down a bit. Get a closer look. Right, over. Here we go, then. What the hell? Where it ended, Colonel. Yeah. Would you like me to play it back to you again, sir? No, no, leave it, Beam. It's heard enough. Sir. <sighs> Did it never occur to anyone to warn the poor devil that roadblocks might not be enough? That this field, this force, call it what the hell you like, might extend upwards as well as laterally? Well, apparently not, Colonel. Yeah, apparently not. Get my car around the front. Oh, sir. Revolution in Midwich, Constable? Uh, just manoeuvres, sir. Uh, but I'm afraid the road's impassable. Yeah. But not both roads, surely? Sorry, ma'am. Oh, we do live there, if it makes any difference. None at all, sir. Your best bet would be to get back to the Eagle, till we get it clear. Be best all round, on account of getting through. I'll walk across the fields, darling. You follow on when the road's clear. Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, not possible, neither. Why must not? Mm. Seeing as how you live there and... It's all right, Constable. These people are friends of mine. I'll deal with it. Oh. Yes, sir. Lieutenant? I'm sure. Hello, sir. Mrs. Gayford. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry, we couldn't make it to the manor, Alan. I thought you'd still be tucked up in your cot nursing a gigantic-sized hangover. <laughs> it, uh, it was last night you and Ferrolyn were announcing the engagement, wasn't it? Finally got it out into the open. Gordon and Angela were delighted. <laughs> I think so, too. Even if Gordon still kept getting my name wrong, oh. insisting it was common knowledge already. <laughs> <laughs> Heard it from their own lips months ago. Oh, dear Dotty Gordon. <laughs> but, uh, alas, duty called, huh? As you say, sir. It's very mysterious, all this. Indeed, sir. Not just manoeuvres, there. You can't get through because nobody can. Uh -huh. The fact is, we're totally out of touch with me, which first came to light when the telephone exchange refused to answer. 
The post office people sent a van off to investigate. It never made it. Oh. Neither did a police car or a fire engine shortly afterwards. We sent a couple of our own men up to the wreck. They got within a couple of feet, then just dropped like flies. Anyway, we've got some inkling of what's happened. Managed to get this harness contraption around one of the fellows, drag him clear. And? Like driving into some kind of war, was what he said. One minute everything normal, and the next as though you'd been poleaxed. From what we've been able to make out, it's affected a two-mile radius, with Midwich bang in its centre. Some kind of gas, do you think? For God's sake, Richard, what about... Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Alan. They'll be all right. I'm sure they will. Thanks. Lieutenant Hughes? Sir, if I were you, I'd leave the car, check in at the Eagle. One hell of a crush, but I dare say they'll be able to squeeze you in somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I dare say. Oh, sorry to have been a bit long, darling. Thought I'd better try and wangle the room for the night while I was at it. Any luck? Oh, easy. Crossed a sweaty palm and settled for a very expensive linen cupboard right at the top. <laughs> oh, Cheers. idiot. Cheers. Mm. Now, what on earth would he be doing among this little lot, I asked my tiny self. Beg your pardon? Well, it is Richard, isn't it? Richard Gayford? Or are these war-weary eyes deceiving me? Oh, I'm sorry, me? I'm, I'm afraid... Uh... Tear away the veil of years, old son. Ardenne, Reichsfeld. How about the Battle of the Rhine? Bernard. <laughs> right, fellas, tricked it in Bernard ten. Westcott, <laughs> but for heaven's sake, I might never... Don't have... say it. A couple of extra chins, a balding pit, and an insidious paunch, and you two could emerge incognito. <laughs> Darling, this is Bernard B. Bernard. I had gathered. Uh, it's my wife, Janet. Ah, Hello. you always did get far more luck than you deserve. <laughs> Delighted. I've sit down, about sit you. down. <laughs> Only for a minute, though. Mm. Yeah, when I knew him, it was Captain Westcott. I know he upped it to Major, but now... Uh... Uh, they ran out of pips. Kicked <laughs> me upstairs into the Bowler Hat and Brolly Brigade <laughs> instead. That sounds very undercover and mysterious. <laughs> Even to those involved. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, what'll it be? No, no thanks. I, I really don't have the time. Besides, the way things are popping around here, I'd have thought you'd have some kind of deadline to meet. Deadline? Oh, good Lord. No, I'm not one of the newspaper brigade, if that's what you're thinking. No, I'm still turning out the odd novel, but I'm afraid deadlines, not to mention bylines, are quite beyond me. I simply assume that with half Fleet Street sprawling all over the lounge, not to mention drinking the cocktail bar uh, dry... Not guilty. Innocent bystanders. Victims of fate, more like. Oh? Yeah. Had to go up to town yesterday. For better or worse, I'm changing the old 10%. Agent. So, of course, agent, yes. So, of course, the better half here cons me into making a splurge of it. Theatre stalls, Curon Bleu dinner, second honeymoon suite at the Savoy. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> anyway, not eight miles from home and still just managing to keep the shirt on my back. Up go your barricades and we find ourselves marooned here for the night. Eight miles from home? Uh, not even that if you take the shortcut across the fields, no. Something wrong with that? Your face is... Not breaking any regulations, are we? We live in Midwich, Bernard. Yes, best part of a year now. I see. I see. Significant? It, um... It could be. Mrs. Gayford, uh, Janet, I... I wonder if you could spare me your husband for an hour or two? Spare? You see, it's this Midwich business that's brought me here. I think Richard could help us. Always providing he's willing, of course. Want to find out what's happened? connected with it. Well, Dick, what do you think? Uh, I don't know. Is it in order to ask who us is? I, um, I could explain it on the way over. Mm, not sure. Darling? Well, I'm thinking of poor Alan's face when he spoke to us in the car just now. Mm. Ferrolyn, Gordon, Angela, they're our friends, darling. We, we may not be there, but it doesn't mean we're not involved, a part of it. No. Go then, I really think you should. Of course I should. I'll bring the car around the front. Yeah, back soon, love. Bye. Oh, Richard, there'll be a lot of top brass there. If they should ask who the hell you are... Yes? Keep mum and leave the rest to me. And that is it, gentlemen. As far as we can tell. Mm. Or hazard a <clears throat> guess? With due respect, Colonel. Captain? We've established that the thing is static, invisible, odourless, non-registering on radar, non-echoing on sound, immediate in effect on mammals, birds, reptiles, insects. So but as to what it actually is, we haven't a clue yet. Not yet, Group Captain. Is what I said. Yes. Chief Constable, you, you do realise that whatever the eventual outcome, it's essential the whole incident is kept quiet. Kept quiet? 
quiet, man. Kept quiet? A two-mile circle of the country completely blanketed by this thing, and, and you expect it to be kept quiet? That was the instruction. Security is of the opinion... Damn security. How the hell do they We've think done we our can... best to put it round as some surprise tactical exercise. <laughs> Group Captain Harding. Hmm? Special dispatch, sir. Oh. <clears throat> Here you are, gentlemen. This cost us two good men in one good aircraft. I hope it was worth it. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look. There it is, sir. Just off centre. Yeah, much the way the poor devil described it. Pale oval, a bit like an inverted spoon. Could be some unusual kind of building. Not a chance. I was round there myself less than a week ago. In which case, our top priority must be to see it doesn't get away. Oh, no. Quite seriously. Yes. Yes. I see. Yes, I'll tell them. Well, ma'am? They're ringing the church bell in Midwich. Crisis over. Crisis oh, over. Oh, As for your top priority, Colonel, what? you can forget it. It was either a mirage, or it's no longer with us. Oh. What happened? Oh. What the oh. devil happened? Oh. Oh. Daddy? Daddy, where are you? I'm over here, dear. As near as I can make out, propping up the bookcase. Oh. Angelo, you, you all right? As far as I can tell. But, but cold. So cold. Yeah. Oof. Oh. Not to mention stiff. Uh. I don't believe these are my legs at all. If you hear a rattling noise, it's my teeth. <laughs> where are they... Ringing the church bell. It's not Sunday, is it? Not unless we've been out cold for the best part of a week. Uh, here's a rug each. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'll see if I can get a fire going. <laughs> Dead as a dodo. Fire. Fire. You know, it's odd that I should have to live this long before appreciating the underlying sunness of fire worship. Uh, how are you feeling, old girl? I survived. What happened? What on earth could have happened, Gordon? Well, if no one knows, I remember seeing Alan off, and you would insist on popping that other bottle of champagne. And don't be idiotic, Daddy. <laughs> Keep your fingers crossed, I think, the sticks of cork. Marilyn, Angela! In here, Alan. Oh, thank God. Darling, are you all right? Well, apart from doing a very good impersonation of Eskimo now, I've never felt better. You'll have to excuse us not getting up. Our joints seem to have cemented. What happened, Alan? What on earth happened? Well, if the truth were known, I think they're all as much in the dark as you are. Positively Stygian, then. Anyway, first things first. Do your best with that fire, darling. There'll be hot drinks in a jiffy. Ooh. Hot <gasps> drinks in a jiffy. Such music in a simple phrase. I'll take my black, thanks. Well, it's damn good of you to give us a lift back. See how anxious you're getting. At least my official clerk let us through before the rest of the pack. Hmm. Ah. Sides, for a dinner like that, I'd have driven you to hell and back. Thank you, kind sir, she said. Except you're not here on behalf of the good food guy, don't you, Bernard? Richard. <laughs> good old Richard. Nobody's fool. So just stop treating me like one. How far have you got? About you? It's a start. Well, uh, to begin with, I'm not letting the uh, Donegal Tweed and Fisherman's Hat fool me. Judging from the amount you contributed, or at least managed not to contribute, to that meeting this afternoon, I'd say intelligence in one of its many guises, right? There are various angles. You're right about something else, too. I came because I had a proposition to make. I still do. So why don't we hear it? Essentially, it's this. Hmm? We feel it's pretty important for us to keep an eye on this place for some time, to know what goes on here. Now, we could introduce one of our own men to keep us posted, but he'd have to start from scratch. If, on the other hand, we could get someone who already knows the place, is accepting... I get by. the drift. But don't think too much of him. No, not much. It rather sounds as if you're asking us to spy on our friends and neighbours. I think a professional would suit you better. This is our home, Bernard. We're part of the community. Which is why I can ask it. Oh? Unless I'm much mistaken, the community may well have need of someone who has its welfare at heart to keep an eye on it. But... 
Almost everybody in this village has been exposed to a curious and totally unfamiliar phenomenon. Oh, whatever it was they saw or thought they saw on the aerial photograph. Hmm. And now you and all the rest of the place are assuming it's all over and finished well, with it. Why? It's come, it's gone, so why not? They simply came and did nothing. Went away again and had no effect on anything. I don't know. No visible effect? No visible effect. Go on, Bernard. Well, it means rather little nowadays, doesn't it? I mean, you can, for instance, have quite serious doses of X-rays, gamma rays, with no immediate visible effect. Well, it's all right, we checked nothing. But something that we were unable to detect was present. Something quite unknown to us that is capable of inducing, well, let's call it artificial sleep. Now, that is a very remarkable phenomenon, quite inexplicable to us, and not a little alarming. Do you really think one is justified in airily assuming that such a peculiar incident can just happen, and then cease to happen and have no effect? Oh, it might be, of course. But surely one should keep an eye on things, if only to see whether such is the case. Or not. Now you're making it sound like some kind of welfare work. I am, aren't I? Just what are you expecting to happen here, Bernard? Would I be asking your help if I already knew? Daddy joining us? Mm -hmm. Oh no. He's been up and gone since dawn. At one of his long walks was what he said. When he runs out of steam and can't work out where he is, he'll be ringing up and expecting us to get him home again. <laughs> oh, that coffee must be stone cold. Let me give you some. No that. thanks, though. You haven't even touched that egg. Oh, isn't it fresh? I just don't feel. oh, very eggy. That's all. As a matter of fact, Angela... Yes? I was sick this morning. I see. Funny thing is, so was I. Horrid, isn't it? What I'm trying to tell you is it's a very special kind of being sick. Kind that happens when you're expecting a baby. Angela? So was mine. But it's not possible. That's what I keep telling myself. Oh, darling, I didn't know. No, no, it's all right. No, really it is. Well, it's against all odds, let's face it. From my age point of view, well, well, possible, but only just. As for your father, three grandchildren by his first marriage, but as far as we were concerned, I, I, I don't think it occurred to either of us... Um, that's all. <laughs> you see? Oh, darling. Angela. Oh, that. It's all over. <laughs> you see, I, I never actually believed it myself. But telling it to someone else suddenly made it real. Oh, I'm thoroughly selfish, too. I'm, I'm so sorry, dear. Oh, you needn't be. I just don't feel weepy about it. I feel frightened. Frightened? But why on earth should you be? It may not be proper, of course, but certainly no need to start getting puritanical about it. The first thing to do is to make sure you're right. I am right. Well, then. But I don't understand it. What's there to understand? Alan certainly won't let you down. He adores you. He does, doesn't he? You're the one that keeps postponing the wedding date. Now there'll be no excuse. Oh, quite the contrary. As far as Alan's concerned, it wasn't Alan, you see. Fairly. No. No, not anybody. You see. That's why I'm frightened. I'm terribly frightened. <laughs> Frightened to the point of hysteria. Some of them are my patients. In your own case, Zellaby, wife and daughter involvement is only too obvious. But what of the others? Unknown as yet, are on the verge of 
God knows what. Uh, how many would you estimate? You're asking me to be specific, Vicar? Well, you must have some idea. 65 to 70. It's rough, I admit, but I think you'll find it about the number of women of childbearing age in the village. Dear God. Dear God. But how, Doctor? Beyond me, I'm afraid. That's why I asked Zellaby along. If not specifically his field, at least the benefit of... Um, Insight? Um, which doesn't enter into it at all, I'm afraid. Apart from normal conception, there are three scientific alternatives that suggest themselves. One, parthenogenesis. That's to say, by means other than sexual. Mm, but never known in higher forms, certainly not mammals. Mm. Two, artificial insemination. I'm inclined to dismiss it. Yes, Doctor. Yes, yes, so am I. In which case? Possibility number three, Vicar. Implantation. Mm. The production of a form that could be unlike that of the parent, or should one perhaps say host. It wouldn't be the true parent. I'd been hoping that might not occur to them. Yes, I hope, my dear doctor, you'd do better to abandon. Or oh, the possibility might not occur to them straight away, but it's one the more intelligent are bound to arrive at before long. In which case, all the births are going to occur over a very limited period, mm -hmm. uh, around... Uh, the end of June, first week in July. And assuming the period of pregnancy to be normal, of course. What worries me most is how to decrease their anxiety and not increase it. One thing for sure, it's imperative we do our damnedest to stop this implantation idea getting around. For as long as it's humanly possible. As even in propitious circumstances, the prospect of birth is awesome enough. Now, if the mother had any reason to suspect it might be some totally inexplicable alien form of life... It might drive her mad, we can't... Right, better get that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Help yourself to a drink. Oh, yes. uh, you too, Vicar. You burned one. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, perhaps just a small one, then. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I'm reading your mind, Vicar. Oh. The need for a woman to take the helm in all this. Well, I should have thought it obvious. Mm -hmm. And equally obvious that you have my wife in mind to fit the bill. Yes, I, I do, Zellaby. Why the devil should she? Just because they trust her absolutely, treat her as some latter-day Lady Bountiful? They do, don't they? Well, it's none of her choosing. She inherited the chores when she was idiotic enough to marry me. They simply do, Zellaby. An emergency? Not any more. Well, one of the um, one of the hands up at Staples Farm, the youngest girl, Julie. Little more than a child, seventeen, eighteen at most. Anyway, nothing to be done. What happened? She hanged herself from a beam. Nothing to say why she did it. Not too difficult to make an educated guess. One of our. Statistics, gentlemen. In conclusion, ladies, ladies and midwitch, I thank you for being here. I appreciate the courage and openness it takes for you to be sitting before me now. <coughs> something, something very strange has happened here, not just to one or two of us, but to almost all who are capable of bearing children. Nobody but a child or a childish person expects life to be fair. It's not. And the months ahead are going to be harder on some of us than others. Yes. Nevertheless, fair or unfair, like it or not, we're all of us, married and single alike, in the same boat. And I'm glad and happy to be counted among you, except that those of us who don't have the love of a husband to help them will have more need of sympathy and care. But, th but this is our affair. You must all know how the cheap papers seize on anything to do with births, particularly anything unusual. But they make a peep show of it, as if the people concerned were freaks in a fairground. The parents' lives, their homes and their children are no longer their own. Well, I, for one, do not intend to lose my child that way. And I expect and hope that all of you will feel the same. Yes. Yes, there would be intruders and interlopers and sensation seekers will be around in force. But it's in our power to see that it remains Midwich's affair. To be managed, not as some ministry or newspaper tycoon decides, 
but as the people of Midwich wish it decided. Hear, yeah. hear. Ah, Dr. Willis. Is it all right if I join you? Mm. Join away. Join away. A bit drunk, I'm afraid. Never the intention of getting a damn sight drunk up. For any particular reason? Wetting the baby's head, aren't I? What better? Just to give it a baby, you see, one of our extra, extra special babies. But surely I... It's premature. So, I had to give him a helping hand. I see. Was it uh, all right? Perfect. Perfect. After all that waiting and worrying, nothing wrong at all. Perfect. Except for... Well? The eyes. It's got golden eyes. In part one of The Midwich Cuckoos by John Wyndham, dramatized for radio by William Ingram, Charles Kay was Bernard Westcott, William Gaunt, Richard Gayford, and Manning Wilson, Gordon Zellaby. Angela Zellaby was Pauline Yates, Ferrolyn, Jenny Quayle, Janet Gayford, Rosalind Adams, Alan Hughes, Gordon DeLue, Dr. Willers, Hugh Dixon, and Vicar Leebody, William Ingram. Colonel Latcher was Gerard Green, Captain Beamish, Martin Ransley, Group Captain Harding, Peter Tudnam, and the Chief Constable, Ronald Baddeley. The policeman was played by David Peart, the pilot by Alex Jennings, and his controller at base by Edward Cost. The technical presentation was by Gareth Watson, and the music specially composed by Roger Lim of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The Midwich Cuckoos was a BBC World Service drama production directed by Gordon House. The Midwich Cuckoos by John Wyndham Dramatised for radio in three parts by William Ingram. With Charles Kay as Bernard Westcott, William Gaunt as Richard Gayford, and Manning Wilson as Gordon Zellaby. The Midwich Cuckoos, part two. Dear Richard, I am sorry, sorry, extremely sorry, that circumstances preclude well-deserved official congratulations to Midwich on the success of the operation to date. It um, has been conducted with a degree of um, discretion and communal loyalty, which um, frankly has astonished everybody in the department. Most of us were of the opinion Official action on our part would prove necessary long before this. Uh, now that uh, all the babies have been safely delivered, I think we are justified in concluding the initial, and one hopes, final crisis is past. Let's sign it sincerely. Sir? Oh, Miss Greer, no distribution, file copy only. And sent it per usual road dispatch. Sir. Morning, Vicar. Ah, oh, Zellaby. Still signing up the recruits, I see? Yes, easing off now. Only two or three more to come. One hundred percent, eh? Just about. <laughs> well, I suppose it gives them the slight feeling of being able to... Um... To regularise matters. Quite. <laughs> yes, young Mary Histon. She chose the name Theodore. All on her own, I gather. 
Oh, that a child like Mary should want to call her baby the gift of God instead of being ashamed of it? Why, it's a tribute to the whole village. Well, then the whole village showed how, in the name of humanity, it ought to behave. Teamwork. With a fine captain in your wife, Zellaby. Uh, no arguments there, Vicar. And uh, with my boy having the Zellaby nose, <laughs> after all... No golden eyes, eh? <laughs> well, well, it's a blessing to be grateful for. I have to confess things seem a bit flat after the battle. Mm. Battles are only the highlights of campaigns. Who's to say there aren't more to come? Hmm? Who are these children, Zellaby? There's something about the way they look at one, those, those curious eyes. They are strangers, you know. I, I can't help it, but I, I keep returning to the notion it, it must all have happened as some kind of test. By whom? Of whom? Well, how can one tell? With strangers. Oh, oh, surely that's your daughter, Zellaby. You're back so soon, then? I thought your mother said something about not being in for lunch. <laughs> Darling? You all right? You don't look at all... I, I will be, but... Just give me a minute. What on earth's happened? Oh, the fact is, Daddy, I... I didn't intend to be here at all. Not at all. You mean you changed your mind? No. Unless I'm very much mistaken, I had it changed for me. Tell me, then. Alan rang at the last minute to say he couldn't get away from the camp. The place was generally getting me down, so I decided to treat the baby and myself to a change of scene. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in particular, just a drive. Well, we just got clear of the village, about four miles along the train road, when the car simply pulled into the side. Broke down? Pulled into the side. Well, I, I don't understand. I didn't expect you to, but the fact remains. Anyway, I got through to the garage and they sent someone out to check. They could find nothing. Nothing at all. It simply refused to budge. The mechanic went back for a tow truck and I decided there was nothing for it but to come back by bus. And? Then it happened. The very instant I decided, positively decided to come back, the engine started up again. Coincidence? I wasn't even behind the wheel. It was him, Daddy. The baby. He didn't want to leave the village. The baby made me come back again. Daddy? You've got to get her away from here, Alan. It's essential. In view of the car incident, I can only stress the sooner the better. I thought I'd made it pretty clear there was nothing I wanted more than to have Farrell in with me. Yes, 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 but we're past that stage. If we weren't, I wouldn't be interfering. It's no longer just a question of what either of you wants or would like. It's what needs to be done. And for Farrell's sake, even more than yours. She wants to join me. She set out to come once. Ah, but she tried to take the baby with her. It brought her back then. Just as it always will if she should ever decide to try again. She's become very attached. You must persuade her to leave without the baby, Alan. It's the only solution. If the baby's not with her, it can exert no influence stronger than natural affection. But according to Dr. Oh, Willers, all this is merely... Willers is making loud, blustering noises to prevent himself from being frightened. You mean this hysteria he talks about isn't the real reason for Ferrolin and the rest coming back here? The hysteria he chunters on about has never been known to manifest itself without one of the babies being present. But I don't see how... The... I mean, how the hell is it done, I've no idea. None. So it really boils down to her choosing either the baby or me. It's not your baby, Alan. And it really isn't Ferrolin's baby either. Or I'd not be talking to you like this. Ferrolin, like the rest, are victims of an imposition. They've been cheated into an utterly false position. With the greatest respect, All sir, these really think... 61 golden-eyed children we have here are intruders. They're changelings. They're cuckoo children. 
The important thing is not how the egg got into the nest, but what comes after it's been hatched. One thing you can count on is its instinct for survival. An instinct characterized by utter ruthlessness. You really think you've got a sound analogy I'm, there? I'm perfectly certain of it. The cuckoo survives because it's tough and single-purposed. That's why you must take Ferrolyn away and keep her away. I've already oh, said she, so. She, she, she'll fight you. She's already more than halfway to accepting the child as her own. You must simply refuse to be blackmailed through her, her better instincts. If Angela's child had turned out to be... Cuckoo child? Yeah. One of them. What would you have done? I should have done what I'm advising you to do. Oh, ah. I thought I heard voices. Study talk, Alan. I hope the old tyrant hasn't been laying down the law to you. <laughs> Hello, Angela. <laughs> Alan, darling. Oh, I'm exhausted. Just give me a minute and I'll make her some tea. No trouble? I'm not sure. I just had Margaret Haxby on the telephone. Margaret? No, I'm not sure you'll remember her. She's now Dr. Margaret Haxby. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. She's apparently quite brilliant. Until recently, she worked on that hush-hush government research business over at the Grange. Until recently? She's gone. Cleared out. She was speaking from London. One of the afflicted. Mm, and one of the most resentful. Mm. Now she's made up her mind to beat it, and she's gone. Leaving Midwich holding the baby. Where's the baby now? Then? Where she was staying, old Mrs. Dory's cottage. The poor old girl doesn't know yet. I'm the one elected to go round and tell her. Yes, but it won't just end there, will it? Can't you imagine the panic it's going to start among all the other women who've taken these girls in? They'll have them out overnight before they get left holding the baby, too. Then what would you suggest? Oh, couldn't you stall? I mean, the girl might change her mind. No, not this girl, Alan. It's not a spur-of-the-moment decision. From what she told me over the phone, she's been through it all pretty carefully. And? She never asked to come to Midwich. She was posted here. If they posted her to a yellow fever area, they'd be responsible for the consequences, wouldn't they? Well, they posted her here, and through no fault of her own, she's caught this instead. So it's up to officialdom to deal with it. Her contention, anyway. Mm. As for the child, she repudiates it entirely. She's no more responsible than if it had been left on her doorstep. And certainly there's no reason why she should be expected to put up with the wrecking of her life or her work on account of it. She's certainly thought it through, hasn't she? Which makes our own predicament all the more urgent. Ah. Oh. Mm, I've just been talking to Alan about getting Feral in a way. Once word gets round, there are going to be quite a few girls taking the... Um, um, Margaret Haxby. Yeah, uh, taking the Haxby girls' example, mm. don't you think? Well, it could well make up their minds for some of them. In which case, don't you think it equally likely there'll be some kind of... some kind of counter-move to stop the desertions? Counter-move? Oh, well, I doubt it would ever come to that. When it comes to publicity, you know how reluctant the authorities no, have no, been... No, 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 not... not by the authorities. Why? What do you Sir? mean? What would happen if the children are as opposed to being deserted as they are to being removed? The children? Hmm. You're surely not suggesting that No, no, that I, they... I, I don't know. Eccentric as it may seem, I am simply doing my best to place myself in the position of a young cuckoo, my dear. As such, I fancy I should, um... I should resent anything that appeared likely to lessen attention to my comfort and well-being. <laughs> One doesn't even have to be a cuckoo. Extension 241. Yes, I do have official clearance, and it damn well is urgent. I am very much obliged. Yeah. Bernard Richard, we've got a panic on. Or oh, something's cropped up. New developments. No, I can't talk about it over the phone, and no, it's nothing I can damn well write about either. <laughs> Look, I know there's a certain official reluctance that you'd rather stick to the formula of let the village work it out for itself, but, well, we're, we're, we're just getting in a teeny bit over our heads. When's the earliest you can get down here? Earliest. Right, I'll get on to Zellaby and some of the others. Oh, bureaucratic Burke. The survival rate of my deliveries, 100%. Resulting in 31 males and 30 females of this, uh, this special type. 
means that only superficial study has been possible. Mm. Some of the characteristics observed, though, were, were common to them all. <laughs> Most striking are the eyes. Mm -hmm. Although they appear to be quite normal in structure, the iris, to the best of my knowledge, is unique. The colouring being of a bright, almost fluorescent-looking gold. It's common to them all. The hair, noticeably soft and fine, is of a slightly darkened blonde shade. The finger and toenails are a trifle narrower than usual, but there's no suggestion of a claw. In general, the babies all appear to be perfectly healthy, although they don't show the degree of, uh, of chubbiness we might expect at their age. The size of the head in relation to the body is that normally found in a somewhat older child. A curious but slight silvery sheen on the skin has given concern <coughs> to some mothers, but uh, this is common to all, and uh, it would appear to be normal to... Uh, the cuckoo children. Uh, to the type. In conclusion, I'd just like to mention that uh, Mr. Zellaby was from the outset of the opinion that the children's origin might be attributable to some form of xenogenesis. Uh, Doctor? The production of a form that could be unlike that of the parent or more accurately, post parent Among humans, there's never been a case known. On the other hand, there's never been a known reason why it shouldn't prove possible. No known reason. But why the diffidence? Do you think the explanation hasn't naturally occurred to all those involved? Oh, I'm sure should the more I'm educated sure. women, my own daughter among them, entirely accept the thesis that they're host mothers rather than true mothers? Yes. The less yes, educated yes, find it an element of humiliation exactly. and tend to ignore it. Yes, and in any event, isn't it high time we got ourselves up to date? Stop speculating about the cause and get down to the altogether more imperative matter of effect? Yes, yes, it's yes, why yes. we've met here, isn't it? Yes. At least I pray to God it's why we've yes, met here. Yes, of course. Yes, yes, what about the return of all the mothers and babies? All this compulsion business. Mm. You can't just ignore it and pretend it'll go away, Doctor. A form of hysteria. Oh, no. Giving rise to collective hallucination. Oh, no, no, no. It will really go away. The hysteria oh. syndrome again, Doctor? How can it be when all the mothers, educated or not, agree the babies can and do exert some form of compulsion? Yes, that's the important part. Now, those who were away, those who were away didn't want to come back here. They came because they had to. I've talked to all of them. What they all say is that they suddenly became aware of a feeling of distress, mm. a sense of need, which they knew could only be relieved by coming back here. Yeah, Classic. Oh, oh, look at the goodness. facts and yes, yes, what yes. do we have? A number of women are the victims of an improbable and as yet unexplained phenomenon. And a number of babies not quite like other babies. That is oh, the facts. The facts, <laughs> the facts <laughs> must be either admitted or somehow sublimated. And the easiest way to do this is to sublimate the situation, to transfer the irregularity into an environment where it no longer appears yes, irregular. That, In this case, uniquely so, Midwich exactly fills the bill. So they pick up their babies and back they come and everything's comfortably rationalised, at least for the time being. Well, it isn't good enough, Doctor. It's time the situation was accepted, recognised. Not glibly, or even learnedly, explain the way. No, we've oh, already got the weaker right. will getting ridiculously superstitious about it. They're crediting their babies with mystical, magical powers. Yes, the whole situation invites now, what we need is an absolutely unbiased investigation. Quite beyond the compass of our local women's institutions. Unworthy, there Doctor. Go. However well-intentioned. Well, that's what I've then, been offering. Then, what would you suggest? Somebody should be making a thorough study of these children. There ought ah. to be a team of experts on the job. Mm. Like the rest of us, I, I kept quiet before the births because I thought it was best for everyone. Well, we and just... the mothers in particular. That's well, right. Right. But that, that need is past. It's nothing less than a national scandal that such a phenomenon as this should be hushed up to the extent of going practically unobserved. Given these children... Think of the opportunity for, for a study of comparative development we have here. Environment, mm. conditioning, association, yes. Yes. diet, and all the rest yes. of it. Yes. 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 What we have yeah. here is a burning of books before they've even been written. Something must be done about it. Well, gentlemen, all very rousing, to be sure. Old Willis can certainly hoist his colours to the masthead when he's a mind to. As you say, Sellaby. But still our mysterious guest from the Ministry remains unconvinced. Hmm? Not about the situation. Only about the best course of action. Singularly missing to date. We thought a low profile might be the best for ah, all concerned. Yes, yes. The proverbial low profile. Predictable, frequently commendable, sometimes inevitable. But when the question of advisability is passed, when the essential need for a more concrete kind of 
action takes its place. There's uh, something new, something you're not letting on to the others. Is there? Oh, come off it, Zellaby. It's not difficult to see you're already one step ahead. Mm. But not always a reason for self-congratulation. Well, then, you have no choice. The fact is, while the good doctor has been peering down his microscope, getting to grips with the laboratory side of things, I've been rather more active in the field. Uh, I don't Richard, understand that. Richard, could you bring your friend here along to the cottage hospital, say, about ten tomorrow morning? I had planned on an early start. I'll delay it. You'll find it to your best interests. Or should that be... Should that be our best interests? It's a lovely evening, isn't it? <laughs> well, there we have it then, gentlemen. Janet, my dear. Four of the children. Two boys, two girls. And the same number of irate parents in the waiting room. Wondering what the hell is going Not on. Patience, boy. Willis, patience. Now then, you're all perfectly satisfied that the children, in separate cribs, carefully screened off, can have no possible means of contact with each other. He'll be giving us the old abracadabra next. Quite satisfied. Right then. Let the experiment begin. The sooner the better. I've got surgery at 11. This then is our apparatus. One small box containing one piece of barley sugar. It's not just any old box, though, you understand? A product of feckless Nipponese ingenuity. It has no visible means of opening, but slide aside this piece of marquetry here, and there's your barley sugar. Miraculous. Patience works. Right. Box closed. Now, which of the infants shall we give first try? But none of these babies is quite one year old yet. It makes no difference. Please, name a child. How about the Brant boy? The Brant boy. The Brant boy it shall be. All right. Now, here we go. Janet, you give it to him. Right. Baby! 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 So, baby, he just thinks it's some baby. kind of rattle. He does, doesn't he? Now, we take the contraption across over here to the Dory boy in the next cube. And as before, we give him the box. He shakes it. He realises it that there's something inside, but he can see no way of getting to it, so this time we show him how. And we give him the sweet, one satisfied customer. Glad somebody's got something out of it. What happens now, sir? We reload the box and go back to exhibit one. There we are, really? the Brent child. Janet, do your stuff. Oh, well, yes. He's taken the box. Oh, now he's... Oh, now that is extraordinary. Not the slightest hesitation, was there? Straight for the concealed opening and pleased as a sandboy with what he finds inside. It's fascinating, don't you think? Wow. You're still sceptical, Dr. Doubt? Well... Reload again, Janet, my dear. Now we'll try it on the girls. Dear, oh dear. Poor old Willers, eh? Did you see his face? <laughs> I wondered for a minute if he'd ever make his surgery. I thought Matron might have to tuck him up in a side ward and treat him for extreme shock. He had my <laughs> deepest sympathy. <laughs> the box idea is pretty effective, yeah. even if I say so myself. Simple, incontestable, and off without a hitch. Here we go. Ah. I brought you Coffee. black coffee, oh, darling. darling. Looked as though you could do with it. Nothing surer. Mm. May we take it that you've been trying other ideas on them? Mm. Yes, quite a number. Some too complicated, others far from conclusive. Besides, I haven't quite got hold of the right end of the stick to begin with. Well, are you quite sure you have now, Zellaby? Because I'm not at all sure that I have. Oh, I think you have. Yes, I'm, I'm sure you yes. have. I suppose you're wanting me to say your experiment shows that what one of the boys knows, all the boys know. Mm. Though the girls do not. And vice versa. Mm. Yes, all right then. Well, that is what it appears to show, but... <laughs> For God's sake, there has to be a catch somewhere. My dear fellow. Mr. Zellaby, are you positively claiming that if I were to tell anything to one of the boys, all the rest would know it? Providing it was simple enough for them to understand it at this stage? But it's unbelievable. Unbelievable? But then you lynch Darwin and you, you show the impossibility of evolution. You could always devise your own test. Or I should have said that the one we've just seen has enough implications to capsize our entire social system. I'm still not convinced. 
mean, couldn't it all be put down to some kind of sympathetic understanding, a kind of thing sometimes found between twins? Not unless it's developed far enough to have revolutionary new features. Besides, what we have here is not one single group en rapport, but two apparently without cross-connections. <laughs> In other words, if I ask a question to any of these boys, I shall get exactly the same answer, and from whichever I choose to ask. If I ask him to perform an action, I shall get more or less the same result. But the decisive point is this. It will not be the individual child who answers me or performs for me. It will be an item of the group. Mm. Go on. Right. What we have, what we seem to have, is 61 individual entities. I maintain we've been fooled, that appearances have been deceptive. What we actually have are two entities only. A boy, a girl. Yes. No, 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 no. Though the boy has 31 component parts each, the physical structure and appearance of individual boys, and the girl has 30 component parts. I find that rather hard to take, Sir My Levy. dear, so did you, I. You're putting forward this as a serious proposition, no, Sir no, Levy. It's not just a dramatic manner of speaking. No, 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 I'm stating a fact, having shown you the evidence first. No, all you've shown us is that they're able to communicate in some way I don't understand. But to go from that to some wild theory about non-individualism is too much at one job. Because you've only seen one test. I've conducted many. None of them contradict the theory. Though I prefer to call it collective individualism. Moreover, it's nowhere near as wild as it appears at first sight. It's quite a well-established evolutionary dodge for getting round shortcomings. A number of forms that appear at first sight to be individuals turn out to be colonies. We ourselves combine in groups consciously instead of by instinct for the same purposes. But why shouldn't nature produce a more efficient version? Unless the human race is to stagnate, we must find some way of getting round them. Mm. I feel a bit like a chameleon, placed on a colour it can't quite manage. You know, I've, I've wondered about these two groups quite a lot. I've even felt there ought to be names for these two super spirits. You'd certainly imagine there were plenty to choose from, and yet... I find just two out of them all persistently invade my mind. Adam and Eve. Thanks for the lift. Oh, no trouble. You should have stayed for lunch. I'd love to have, but they'll be all hell let loose the other end of the day. Still? Yes? I wouldn't have missed the Zellaby magic show for the world. Oh, come on, that's not good enough. No. What can it all mean? Something. Nothing. Which is where we came in. I'll gee up the official interest, of course, but I'm still depending on you to keep your finger on the pulse, keep me informed. Uh, except I'm not sure how much longer I'll be around to do that. Oh? Well, apart from already being way out of my depth, Janet and I may be moving on. What, leaving Midway? Yes, this uh, this new agent of mine seems to be earning his 10%. Something he set up for me in Canada. The terms are all right, and Jan's keen. It's New Horizons. It sounds very promising. You're likely to take it, then. Uh, after what I've just seen... Yes? It gets more likely by the minute. Gordon? Darling, hmm? are you asleep? Uh, I'm just hiding behind my eyes. I'm thinking about this morning. At the hospital? Their expressions of ingrained scepticism. Still, I expected no different. But there must be an explanation. Of course. And what do you think it is? It's too early. We'll have to wait until the children are old enough to give us some evidence. But you do have some ideas? As you are a discreet woman, <laughs> let me put one question to you. It's this. If, if you were wishful to challenge the supremacy of a society that was fairly stable and quite well weaponed, what would you do? Would you meet it on its own terms by launching a costly and certainly destructive assault? Or, or if time were of no importance, would you employ an altogether more... Subtle tactic. A fifth column. A f fifth column? To attack it from within.
In part two of The Midwich Cuckoos by John Wyndham, dramatized for radio by William Ingram, Charles Kay was Bernard Westcott, Manning Wilson, Gordon Zellaby, and William Gaunt, Richard Gayford. Angela Zellaby was Pauline Yates, Ferrolin, Jenny Quayle, Janet Gayford, Rosalind Adams, Alan Hughes, Gordon DeLue, Dr. Willers, Hugh Dixon, and Vicar Leabody, William Ingram. The technical presentation was by Gareth Watson, and the music specially composed by Roger Lim of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The Midwich Cuckoos was a BBC World Service drama production directed by Gordon Huffs. Fly across the sky Taking us higher as we reach for the stars up high Let's leave our worries behind and let our hearts ignite With paper airplanes, we'll conquer the night In the silence of wishes, the paper takes flight in the dance of dreams under the moon's soft light With every crease the story unfolds In the journey of paper Remember The Midwich Cuckoos by John Wyndham Dramatized for radio in three parts by William Ingram With Charles Kay as Bernard Westcott William Gaunt as Richard Gayford And Manning Wilson as Gordon Zellaby the Midwich Cuckoos, Part 3. Surprised to hear from you. Quite the opposite. The surprising thing was you hadn't been in touch before this. Oh? Well, heard on the grapevine, Richard Gayford and wife had been repatriated once or twice. Oh, just visiting relatives. Still, thought you'd be in touch. Why on earth should I? Curiosity. About Midwich? A simple curiosity. How was Canada, anyway? Uh, uh, it's pretty uneventful. So, just what the doctor ordered, eh? Hmm. Midwich, six miles. Seems a million light years ago. Eight of the Earth variety, actually. Uh, the old eagle still seems to be doing good business. I'd suggest a reunion pint, but this inquest I've got to sit in starts at two. Was it one of the cuckoo children? No, local fellow called Powell. Motor accident. Tragic. Well? Tragic. You still think of them as that, then? Cuckoo children? And the others, then? Probably. They've just become, well, shall we say, less forthright about it. Oh, isn't that the old grain? Uh, pull in, would you, just for a minute? Just for a minute, then. Midwich Grange, Special School, Ministry of Education. The children? Exactly. Well, Zellaby's exotic conception was a lot less exotic than it seemed. You remember that experiment of his, the barley sugar in his mm. secret Chinese box, no apparent way of getting at but it. But show one boy the way in and it became common knowledge for the rest. Exactly, but well, mm. it didn't stop there. At just two years of age, one of the boys learned to read simple words. At two? The next day, they found any of the boys could read them. A week or so later, the same thing happened with the girls. One breaking through the barrier, and the rest inheriting the gift. But how? Oh, the arguments are still academic. The point is, however, it happens. They do have this rapport within the group. Sending them to ordinary schools was out of the question, so they... they came up with this place. A school come welfare come social observatory for them. It sounds the queerest setup I've ever heard of. Well, if you throw your mind back, it had a somewhat queer beginning. Mm. Well, uh, push on, shall we? Order, I say. It's not no coroner's call we got called for here. It's judge and jury. Restored, I shall have no alternative but to empty the hall. Mr. Zellaby. Sir. Yes. Mr. Zellaby, I'm given to understand that you were in the near vicinity at the time of this 
most unfortunate occurrence. I, I wouldn't say near. But in sufficient proximity as to give you a very clear impression as to cause and effect. Yes, I, I suppose you could say that. And perhaps you'd be good enough to oblige the court. I was returning from my usual afternoon stroll. As I reached the turn into Hickam Lane, four of the children from the Grange came out of it and turned towards the village. Three boys and a girl. Go on. I wasn't paying them any particular attention, but a bit further on they turned a corner. I lost sight of them. It, it wasn't until I reached the same corner myself that the car overtook me. A small, open two-seater. The late James Powell's car? Uh, though I, I didn't recognise it at the time. You were at the corner. What happened next? The children were strung out right across the road, as though they were arguing which way to go. It, it was all over so quickly. The car driver did his best. Another two inches and he'd have missed them altogether. As it was, the tip of his left wing caught the outermost boy on the hip and flung him right across the road into a cottage garden. Yeah, and then? You tell what I'm the poor Jim Powell yeah. van, sir. Yeah. 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 Tell us! Yeah. Tell us now! Yeah. Tell us now! Yeah. Come on, tell us! Yeah. 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 In your own time. I... I don't know. I, I can't be sure if the car stopped or not. If it did, just the barest moment. Then the... The engine roared. The driver changed up, put his foot down again, keeping straight ahead. It was still accelerating when he hit the churchyard wall. Inexplicable. Nothing one could do. Inexplicable. Richard, my dear fellow, ah, I hardly right? believe my eyes when I spotted you at the back. Uh, Janet, not with you? Uh, visiting relatives got priority, I'm afraid. <laughs> Still sight for sore eyes, eh, Westcott? As you say, sir. Now, the last go-off, it was India, wasn't it? Uh, Canada. Five years? It was nearly eight, actually. <laughs> well, it just goes to show. <laughs> Nothing to do with this inquest business, though? No, I... no, just one for the right. Ah. Still, I could have chosen a happier occasion. Hmm. Tragic. Uh, look, if you're not in a tearing hurry, come up to the house and have a spot of tea. Angela will be delighted oh, to see you. Oh, nothing I'd like better. Could you just give us a half hour, though? Uh, the, um... The odd errand to run. Hmm. Well, expect you when we see you, then. Oh, Westcott, if you're driving, take it carefully, after what you've just heard. I'm not a dangerous driver. Nor was young Powell. He was a good driver, too. Oh, when we see you, then. Yes. Bye. Bye-bye. So what was this mysterious errand you suddenly decided to land us with? Mrs. Williams, landlady of the Scythe and Stone button hold me as we were leaving. It sounded urgent. Still not sure if I'm doing the right thing in telling you, sir. Lord only knows gave my word and all, but sitting through the inquest and the way they made it all seem... Perhaps oh, it would be better if no, I... No, I'm sure it. Mrs. Williams doesn't mind you being No, 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 sir. In your own time. Well, that inquest... It's what happened after the accident that never came out. Uh, heard the bang, people running. Then, a minute or so later, I spotted Mr. Zellaby, sitting on a bench near the green he was, and grey like you'd never believe in, and just passed out. Oh, huh? <laughs> All for getting the doctor I was, but, well, the way he puts it to me, no point at all, he says. Important not to trouble the people one loves. So he makes me promise to keep quiet. Um, but I... Uh... And, and no living soul would never have got it from me, except for what he went on to say after. About the accident? Funny sort of voice. Before the poor fellow drove into the wall, he hit one of the children. But he testified as much at the inquest. One of the children, I said. And suddenly I saw what he was meaning. 
most stopped because the way he was looking at me. Did he say anything more? Yes, sir. Perhaps I should have found it less upsetting if at some previous stage of my quite long life I had already had the experience of witnessing deliberate murder. You really needn't look so put out, Westcott. Got an inkling something was in the wind when you fobbed me off with your mysterious errand. Anyway, I had no right burdening the poor woman with my personal problem. Yes, well, we're sorry you're not well, Celebi, but suggesting that the children caused that accident, I mean, actually made young Powell drive straight into I'm that wall. I'm not suggesting, I am stating they did it. Just as surely as they made their mothers bring them back here. But the other witnesses at the inquest, the ones who gave evidence... Were as aware of what happened as I am. It wasn't the inquest's concern. They only had to say what they actually saw. But if if they know it's as you claim... Then why stop at the Powell boy? He's not the only victim. Oh? Did you know that poor old Dr. Willers eventually abandoned his championship of some kind of mass hysteria? He was... Forced to. A very short time before he died. Died? But he wasn't much over 50, was he? How did it happen? Overdose. Some kind of barbiturate. Willis? For God's sake, he was never the sort. No. He really wasn't, was he? Willis? The Powell boy? How many others? What are you suggesting? Oh, that word again. Only that... We live much more precariously in Midwich than any of us had ever thought. It just happened that poor young man came round the corner at that fatal moment. It could just as easily have been Angela or anybody else. There's no blame attached. He tried his best to avoid hitting any of them. Not good enough. In a flare of anger and revenge, they killed him for it. Just the same. These last few years really have been like living on the slopes of a volcano. That's Angela. I'd be grateful if you wouldn't let on about my old ticker problem. It would serve no purpose. Yeah, of course. Uh, we're in here, darling. Your company? Huh. Oh, how nice. I, I really wasn't Angela? expecting anyone. Hello, Richard. After such a long time, too. Must be some kind of red letter day. Oh. oh uh, Angela, my dear, here. Oh. Yes, sit down. Sit down. Uh, oh. Richard, old fellow. Uh, uh, some yes, brandy on the sideboard. Oh. Yeah, how stupid. Oh, shh, 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 shh. I'm so sorry. Sit, sit. All right. Everything's going to be all right. All right, Oh, thanks. Oh, that's better. Now take your time. More? No. No. No, thanks. Darling, what happened? Well, while you were at the inquest, it came into my mind that Mrs. Powell could probably do with a bit of company, so I took a stroll over to the farm. Mm -hmm. I was still sitting with her when the younger brother, David, got back. Apparently they'd been very close. He was obviously extremely upset. He said the inquest was the last straw, and that if nobody else was going to see justice done over his brother, he'd do it himself. Understandable. Well... He was carrying a gun. We we did our best to stop him. He, he wouldn't listen to us. Nor to his girlfriend, Elsa. She followed him to the Grange. But there was no sign of him. Nothing. Until that first shot. Shot? He, he was aiming at a group of the children further down the lane. Oh, no. Elsa called out, begging him to stop. He didn't seem to hear her. Instead, he reversed the gun on himself, put his thumb on the trigger, and... and... Get that, will you? Oh. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Westcott speaking, Chief Constable. Oh, my God. Well, of course. I'll be with you as soon as I possibly can. Bernard? Your volcano is no longer dormant. Half the village is marching on the Grange. 
one woman and three men dead. Eight men, five women in hospital, and a hell of a sight more that look as though they should be. For God's sake, don't just sit there. You're head of this school or establishment or whatever fancy name you choose to put on it. As chief constable, I'm entitled to some kind of explanation. I'm sorry, Sir John, but I don't think I could have made the situation last night quite clear to you. Oh, I'm sick to the eye teeth of hearing that, too. How the devil you can let the situation get so out of hand as to cause a breach of the peace is down to your responsibility. In the meantime, I'm here to question the ringleaders and decide my best course of action. But I've already explained to you there are no ringleaders. Ah, all equals and the rest of the educational folder all in theory fair enough. But in every group there are fellows that stand out. Manage them and you manage the rest. Two of the children, sir. Uh, show them in. Sir John, if I might suggest, choose your words carefully. The children are very sensitive. <clears throat> you asked to see us? Yes. Uh, Eric, Priscilla, this is... We uh... prefer to stand. We might already have met. Westcott, Bernard. Yes. The Chief Constable here wishes to ask you some questions. It's his... Um... His duty to make a report on the trouble here last night. Exactly. People tell me you and the others were here. Now, what have you to say about that? No. What um, happened exactly? The village people came to burn the Grange down. Are you sure of that? It's what they said. So why else should they be here? We will not go into the whys and wherefores for the time being. Let's take it from there. You say some came to burn the place down. The others, did they come to stop them? Was that how the fighting started? Well? Yes. You don't sound too sure. I'm sure. We made them fight each other. This way, they realise it is better for them to leave us alone. You said you made them fight. How did you do that? It is too difficult to explain. Nevertheless, I'd like to damned well hear. We simply defended ourselves. Resulting in three dead and fourteen serious injuries? Unavoidable. When you could just as easily send them away? They would have come again. Don't you feel the least compassion for these unfortunate people? No. We must protect ourselves. But not by private vengeance. The law is for your protection and for everyone else's. The law only punishes the criminal after he has been successful. It is no use to us. We intend to stay alive. So, you don't mind being responsible for the deaths of other people? As it seems to be quite beyond your limited comprehension, I will put it more simply. If there is any attempt to interfere with us, or molest us by anybody... We shall defend ourselves. We have shown that we can. You damned young blackguard, you insufferable little prig. John. How dare you speak to me like that? Do you understand I represent the police force of this country? Please, John. If you don't, it's time you no, learnt it, and I'll John. see that you do by it God. It would be best for you to stop now. How dare you talk to your elders like that, you swollen-headed little upstart? Stop! So, you're not to be molested. You'll defend yourselves, will you? You've got a lot to learn, my lad. A lot! Ah. Eric, Eric, uh, please, no more. Sir. Eric, stop it! No, uh, that's enough. Please! He's not hurt. He wanted to frighten us. So we have shown him what it means to be frightened. He'll understand better now. He'll recover. When the glands are in balance again... Uh, All right when the glands uh, are in balance again. Better at physiology than psychology. They've broken that man for the rest of his life. Uh, sugar. It's by your left hand, dear. Huh? Oh. Uh, salt. By your right. <laughs> you know, one of the few childlike things about the children... Their inability to judge their own strength. They wanted to scare Sir John this morning. They went so much further. They, they brought the poor man to a state of grovelling fear near the brink of imbecility. Sickening and utterly unpardonable. Mm. Which assumes that they expect to be pardoned. Why should they? 
Do we consider ourselves, whether jackals or wolves, will pardon us for shooting them? No, we do not. Oh, not KN, dear. Not what? No, it never gives you hiccups. Oh, yes, 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 yes. But surely we suddenly have a change of front here. I mean, apart from the few very early instances, there's been almost no violence. Now we have this outbreak. I mean, can you pinpoint the start of it, or has it been working up? Nothing before Jimmy Powell and his car. Wednesday, the 3rd of July. Westcott? As you say. As I say. We're waiting for the salad, dear. Uh, yes, so you are. Mm. My own experience of interplanetary invasion has been vicarious. Invasion. Hypothetically vicarious. Or do I mean vicariously hypothetical? Interplanetary invasion. It's certainly be the great problem is to know when you're to be taken literally and when metaphorically. Westcott? In this case, quite literally. How long have you known it for a fact? Eight years. And you? About the same. Hmm. Even a little before. Oh, you're surely not suggesting these children are... Invaders. Well, that they originate somewhere... Outside Earth. Mm. Oh, you can't be serious. <laughs> you see, Westcott, no instant panic, just scepticism. Angela. Forewarned, if not exactly forearmed. But Midwich was not the only one or even the first to have a day out, was it, Westcott? Four day outs. That we definitely know of. Well, I'll be damned. Small township in the Northern Territory of Australia. Something went badly wrong. 33 pregnancies all dead in a matter of hours. Eskimo settlement, Victoria Island, North of Canada. The inhabitants are cagey. We think they were so outraged, alarmed at the arrival of babies so unlike their own, they exposed them almost at once. No survivors. The third and fourth... Now, let me guess. Behind the Iron Curtain? Both. The first near the border of Outer Mongolia. Grim. The men assumed their wives had been lying with devils. They perished along with the children. So it's the last one that counts, isn't it? Far to the east, a place called Gijinsk. Their day out took place a week before our midwich one. They sealed the place off in hours. By then we had our own quandary. We couldn't seal off midwich. So you did the best you could. Let's all wait and see. If the Russians have a flock of potential geniuses, it could prove damned useful to have a similar flock to put up against them. Something like that. Bernard, why are you admitting all this? I mean, there's been some new development out there that our own children are likely to display shortly. The Russians recently developed a new medium-range atomic warhead. Oh. The town of Gijinsk no longer exists. You mean everybody there? Everybody. The entire place. Because nobody could have been warned without the children knowing of it. Hmm. Officially, they've um, put it down to a technical error, or possibly sabotage. Why should you know differently? Carefully channeled observations from Russian sources, guarded on details and particulars, but uh, no doubt about it meaning Gijinsk. It doesn't refer to Midwich either. What it does do is put out a most forcibly expressed warning after a description which fits the children exactly. It insists over and over again, even to the point of pleading, that all governments everywhere should neutralise any such known groups with the minimum delay, because these children are a threat to the whole human race. When did they deal with this, this place in Russia? Which day? Tuesday, the 2nd of July. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Well, the day before young Powell's accident. I wonder how ours knew. Bullseyes? Bullseyes. We know how they love them, so better make it one of those very large bottles. Oh, well, well, you I... did say you were popping into train, didn't you? Mm. I uh, bumped into that uh, the, the Eric lad on my stroll. Oh, one of the... Uh... Yes. Are yeah, you looking forward to my film lecture on the Aegean this evening? Very flattering. Very untypical, I'd say. No, not at all. They're not stupid, you know. They're susceptible to reasoned argument. When they're jittery and nervous, they do foolish things. So now all we have to do is to say, sorry you killed six people by mistake. Let's forget all about it. Would you prefer to antagonize them? Gordon, I don't understand well, you. Different yardsticks, that's all. You're judging by social rules and finding crimes. And you, Zellaby? Considering an elemental struggle. And finding no crime. Just grim, primeval danger. The wise lamb does not enrage the lion. It placates him, 
place for time and hopes for the best. Darling. Now, you won't forget those bullseyes, will you, my love? They'll be expecting them. Hello, Mr. Zellerby. Ah, Eric, is that you? Mr. Zellerby? Ah, uh, you've come down to give us a hand, eh? Splendid, splendid. Right, well then, let's make a start. Ah, uh, uh, roller screen, that's it, and uh, microphone, careful. Ah, uh, and bless my soul. If it isn't a jar of bullseyes. Mr. Zellerby. <laughs> well, I hope there'll be a good attendance. We'll all be there. Splendid, splendid. Right, um, well, just that small case, and we're done. Well, that's it, then. Off you go inside. Uh, it's just one more, isn't there? The heaviest. You'd already packed it when we loaded the rest. Uh, yes, so I had. Well, uh, <laughs> that's about it, then. Uh, Zellerby... I, uh, I'd ask you to join us, but I must confess, Angela is considerably in my thoughts this evening. I, I was rather hoping that you, my dear fellow, that you, um, it would be a great kindness. Of course. Excellent. I knew I could rely on you. <laughs> I must go now. Yeah. You'll be getting impatient. Back, Angela. All right. Fine, fine. Fix us a drink, will you, Richard? Hmm. Zellerby was dead right when he said they trusted him. Perhaps. Hmm? Well, it's simply that I don't trust them. Let's face it, there's no telling what they might do. Anywhere, any time. Oh? It's a fact, Richard. Even Gordon admits they're nervous and panicky. How can we go on staying here with our lives at the mercy of any childish fright or temper that comes over them? What kind of ultimatum can we ever make? What makes you think they're going to try their arm here anyway? No, you take it from me. If it comes to it, they'll do it where it counts. They'll go up to London, take on Bernard, the rest of the bigwigs. Uh, pushing around that poor blighter of a chief constable is one thing, but how far do you think they'd get with it? Strange, wasn't it? He blew up the Grange. But no bitterness, my own dear love. The doctor will confirm for you a matter of a few weeks or months at best. This way at least there will have been meaning, purpose. It seems we've lived so long in a garden we've all but forgotten the commonplace of survival. The message is fundamental. To keep alive in a jungle, you must live as the jungle does. In the final part of The Midwich Cuckoos by John Wyndham, dramatised for radio by William Ingram, Charles Kay was Bernard Westcott, Manning Wilson, Gordon Zellaby, and William Gaunt, Richard Gayford. Angela Zellaby was Pauline Yates, the Chief Constable, Ronald Baddeley, the Coroner, Nigel Graham, Dr. Torrance, Peter Tudnam, Mrs. Williams, Catherine Parr, and the two children, Jill Didston and Rosalind Adams. Simon Hewitt played a court witness. The technical presentation was by Gareth Watson, and the music specially composed by Roger Lim of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The Midwich Cuckoos was a BBC World Service drama production directed by Gordon House.